Okay, good, great. So everybody can hear me, wonderful. Awesome. Okay, so the way we're going to do this is I'm going to introduce Robert and tell you about his bio. He has a lot of experience in the financial aid world. We're going to talk about all the changes happening. And we are going to open it up at the end for a few questions. We, you know, there's, I have a lot of people registered for this webinar tonight. So we're not going to be able to get to all of them, but we will open it up and I'll um, bring a few questions to the table that Robert and I will answer for all of you. And um, so as we're kind of going through the webinar, if you just want to put that, the questions in the chat box, we'll kind of get to them at the end. And then I know, um, unfortunately, we won't be able to cover them all, but I will maybe cover them on my um, Facebook page or YouTube channel and, and try to get those all answered on a, a different platform. So welcome, Robert. I'm so excited to have you. And for those of you don't, who don't know Robert, this is Robert Wienerman. He is a bit of a celebrity in the Financial Aid Association world, and uh, he is in the third part of a decades-long three-tiered career in college finance. He started his career in college finance as a financial aid administrator at MIT, where he became the aid office's go-to person when an applicant's family had a complex financial situation, owned a business or farm, or was a beneficiary of a trust. All, you know, people always have questions about that on the FAFSA. Robert also worked as an aid officer at Babson College in several smaller New England institutions as a financial aid consultant. His second career in college finance, college finance was as a college finance counselor at a company called College Coach. So other companies hired College Coach to provide their employees with counseling about how to save for or pay for college, which is so important, and later how to efficiently repay their student loans or help their children repay their loans. Robert built a team of 10 former aid officers to do this work as college coach grew. Since 2014, Robert has, as his third career in college finance, worked as a trainer to financial aid officers, helping them understand their responsibilities around determining a student's eligibility for federal financial aid and what they need to do if an applicant is selected for verification or appears to have made an error in their application. Since Robert will be training financial aid officers how to do this work in the 24-25 aid cycle, his first training is actually tomorrow, October 2nd, he has spent his summer studying the new FAFSA and new financial aid formula. So he is a bit of an expert. Welcome, Robert. We're so happy to have you tonight. Thank you, Tina. I am, I'm happy to hear. I'll be here. So I'm going to just kind of dive right in and, and we'll talk about all the questions. I, I'm getting these questions every single day. Um, so we're really looking forward to your expertise and clarification so everybody can kind of better understand um, what they're looking at for the 24-25 year. So let me just pull up my questions here. And we'll get started. So one of a couple of the big things, um, you know, of course, the first big thing that I want to mention to everybody here, normally the FAFSA opens today. Every single year, October 1st is the day the FAFSA opens up for completion. But because of the FAFSA simplification process, all the big changes that are happening, the FAFSA is not going to open until December. So I'm getting a lot of questions about when in December, but we were just talking about that, Robert, and we're not quite sure when, correct? There's That's right. The department yeah. has just said December. No additional yeah. information is available. So as soon as I have that information, I will, of course, be sure to share it with all of you. One of the really great things happening to the FAFSA is the simplification process. It's going from, right now it's about 108 questions, and I believe it's going down to 36 questions. Is that correct, Robert? Yeah, I think it might be 38, but yes. 38, okay, right around there. So, I mean, they're cutting the questions in a third, which is actually um, really great. It's going to make it more user-friendly and, and not so tedious for families to fill out. So let's first talk about one of the biggest changes happening um, that is related to the number of people, the number of family members in college. So there is going to be elim an elimination of the huge role of having more than one family member in college from the financial aid formula. So first, if you could just kind of talk about why they made such a big change to this. Yeah, um, I, I will say before I answer that question, it, it came as quite a surprise to a lot of people. Um, there were some people in the higher education community that were advocating for a change like this, but nobody expected it would actually happen. Um, I think uh, the, the stated reason for the change was that it created a situation where people who had close children who were 
born close together were ended up paying a lot less than people who had their children spread out. And they were, there wasn't really a, a way that they could kind of account well for the fact that if you have children coming up for college, some of your resources should be set aside for them. So they kind of turned it over and they eliminated the uh, old theory that said, we're going to calculate how much resources you should have available to pay for college and allocate it among your students to this new one, which is we're going to calculate uh, the amount of resources that you have and each of your children will be entitled to that. Um, they did. There is a way to address it, though, uh, but it's just a little bit uh, different. And I think I'm jumping ahead, probably. No, to go your for next it. Question. Yeah, no, go so, for it. So, so um, while people used to automatically get the benefit that the answer to the formula would be allocated or divided among the number of uh, siblings in college. What is available now is if someone has more than one child in college, the schools are allowed to take that into account on a case by case basis um, through a process that most people think of it as the appeal process. Um, the, uh, the term that financial aid officers use is professional judgment. And so if you are a parent who has two children in college and you're thinking, wow, I'm really losing out here, what you would want to do is you want to be prepared to reach out to the schools that each of your children are applying to. And when you get the first financial aid award, send that with a letter saying, um, I'm going to have to pay this much money for my other child in college. And the school is allowed to reduce the income that they assess by that amount of money. Okay. Um, and so instead of the school automatically saying, okay, you've got two kids in college, we're only entitled to half of the money um, that we think you should be able to cover, the school would say, okay, you have this much income, but you also have, say, $20,000 that you have to allocate to your other child. So we're going to subtract $20,000 from your income and then re recalculate. So take that out of yeah. the whole equation when determining financial aid, which is going to be yes. helpful. I mean, I don't know if it'll be the same benefit as like taking that expected family contribution and splitting it by the number yeah. of children in college. Yeah. Um, but it's going to help at least. There were a couple of weird situations with the old formula. I don't know if you knew this, Tina, but for lower income families, the two in college or three in college uh, factor would increase the, the EFC. Um, because of the way the family allowance was mm. calculated. So this eliminates that. It also eliminates the situation where you've got perhaps one of your children is at a high cost private institution and your other is enrolled half time at a community college and living at home. And so you're getting a $40,000 reduction on the, from the private school with no real outlay for the community college. So there are some people that will benefit from this, but in general, the key for people who are, parent, who are parents with seniors and concurrent enrolled students is just let the schools know how much you're paying after financial aid for the other school, and they can take that into account and make an adjustment for it. Right, you. which which I'm for anybody that follows me, you know, you know that I'm a really big proponent of appealing your financial aid offer. So this is just going to be like you know, a, a part of that process is letting them know that you have more than one child in college. So super, super important for parents that have more than one child in college. So the other big thing happening is what's now called the expected family contribution or the EFC. This is the number that's derived when you all fill out a FAFSA form and the, the government performs a federal methodology and they come up with this, this number called the EFC. It's now going to be called the SAI or the student aid index. So Robert, can you explain the reason for this change and talk a bit about how the new needs analysis is going to work when it comes to determining the SAI? Yes, absolutely. Um, so, so if someone said to you, your expected family contribution is $10,000, you would probably take that to mean that at the end of the day, at the end of having your son or your daughter in school, you would have spent $10,000 because that was what you would have expected the parent contribution to be. But that's not really what was happening. Um, that was more like a 
kind of estimate of what you might be able to pay, but there was no obligation on the part of the school to give you enough financial aid so that you'd actually end up paying that. So the figure was kind of, the, the terminology was incorrect. And so, you know, in the spirit of, you know, honest disclosure, the federal government changed it from expected family contribution, which was really quite a meaningless term, into student aid index, which is what it is. It's an index. It's a statement of the relative amount of, uh, let's say, if you line everybody up on the student aid index, the lower your student aid index, the more likely a school should uh, uh, give you need-based financial aid. Right. Um, so, so that that change was really designed to eliminate the bait and switch around the term EFC or expected family contribution, which was unless you were lucky enough to go to a, a highly uh, endowed school that met full need all the right. time, unreal, unrepresentative of what you'd actually right. Have. Because families yeah. would see that number and think, okay, that's yes. the amount of money I have to pay. So that's kind of why they're they're making the change, which makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's also some big changes happening around what assets and sources of untaxed income have to be reported on the FAFSA. So can you talk yeah. a little bit about this? Yeah, let me work from untaxed income and then do assets. So, sure. Um, so the FAFSA Simplification Act that uh, created most of the formulaic changes um, imposed a requirement on the department that they could only use income information that they could get off of the tax return. And so in the, uh, on the tax return, there are only a small number of untaxed income items. And so given that the law says the Department of Education can only use information that can be derived from the tax return, they had to eliminate a whole bunch of things that aren't on the tax return. So in 23, 24 and earlier, you would be asked when you're filling out an application to say, how much do you contribute to your 401k, 403b, 457 plan, et cetera. Those are not on the tax return. So that untaxed income is no longer, uh, the department can no longer use it in the formula. Similarly, um, housing subsidies outside of military housing subsidies were required to be reported, workers' compensation, um, and then the big one and the most frustrating one for a lot of people, uh, what we used to call money received or payments made on the student's behalf. Uh, you, if, a stu if anyone other than the student's FAFSA parents paid for the student's education, that was untaxed income to the student, that's gone. And so now we're really only looking at four or five kinds of untaxed income on the application, all of which are on the tax return. Um, I probably can't come up with all of them, but they include um, untaxed, uh, tax-exempt interest income, untaxed portion of IRA distributions and pension distributions, excluding any rollovers that were done, um, contributions, ha contributions to IRA, uh, IR, the IRA deduction contributions to IRAs or uh, work-related IRAs like SEP IRAs or simple IRAs. Um, I think that's about it. But yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, that's a big change that that's, I mean, yeah. that's, so that's a good, those are good changes. That is, that is a good change. And it actually creates, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't like to coach people about how to get more financial aid unethically, right? but you know, one outcome of this is the more you contribute to your 401k or your 403b or your 457 plan, the less income goes into the formula that used to be added back. Now it's not. Right. That's huge. Um, right. Yeah. All those contributions that families would make would get added back in as untaxed income. Exactly. So that's, that's a pretty yeah. good and significant change that's happening. It, it is. And then the oh. one big change that, um, I'm not sure how they kind of came up with this, but child support received was a untaxed income item in 2023, 20, 24 and earlier. Um, but that's not on the tax return, so it can't be treated as income on the tax return. But people who receive child support will still be asked to report it, and it will actually be treated as though it were an asset, uh, which is assessed at a much lower rate. So it is a little... 
it's a place where they're taking what is effectively income and they're defining it as an asset for a lower assessment rate. Um, but that's the other big change. In yeah, that's, income. That, that's really big. That, thanks for clarifying that. And then another change that's pretty significant happening regarding divorce or separation in terms of parents of dependent students, you know, right now as it stands um, in the 23, 24 year and before, if you're divorced or separated, the parent with whom the child resided with most within the last year is the parent who fills out the FAFSA. But that's yes. no longer going to be the case going forward if you want to just share a little bit about that. Yes, uh, absolutely. In 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 the spirit of aligning the FAFSA and the tax code, uh, you know, as I said, only income that shows up on the tax return can be in the FAFSA. Similarly, the parent who's required to contribute information to the FAFSA if the parents aren't together is now the parent that provided the most support in the prior year before the FAFSA was filed. Regardless uh, yeah. of whether they're the custodial or non-custodial parent. That's correct. So it okay. used to be the parent in whose home the student lived the most in the prior 12 months. Now it's the parent that contributed the most support in the prior 12 months. And that is a, the purpose of that change is to align the FAFSA with the uh, dependent rules on the tax form. Um, practically, the student will be the one that kind of assesses which of my parents provide the most support. At this point in time, we don't have a lot of guidance from the department about how they're supposed to do that. There will be a tool called the parent wizard that should walk the student through a process of determining which parent um, they should use. Uh, I would suggest to people that they make a good faith effort to determine which parent is actually providing the most support. Um, and, but the reality is uh, most schools are only going to have the information that comes in on the FAFSA. Um, and so they're not going to know anything about the parent who doesn't contribute. So they're not going to have a way of assessing whether the student chose the right parent or not. So that was my next question, because I have a lot of parents asking, well, how are they going to determine? How are they going to know? Are they going to ask for proof? So, so it's really just going to come down. I mean, Financial aid offices reserve the right to ask for anything, you know, That's any right. information of what you put on your FAFSA form. Yeah. But the reality is they're going to kind of rely on families to make that determination, correct? That's and, correct. Okay. With, with okay. two caveats. If the student is applying to a school that requires the non-custodial information for or the other parents' information for institutional purposes, the school will have a sense about where the wealth resides right. between the parents. And if it seems unrealistic that the parent who provided the information on the FAFSA could be providing the most support, then that the school might challenge that. Okay. Uh, they, might, they might have to ask a question. And, and then and the other one we just talked about, which is child support. If the, if the parent who's filing the FAFSA with the student reports that they received $30,000 of child support and has $10,000 of income, that's going to be a red flag that maybe the other parent is actually the one that's providing the support. So we can't say it's never going to be flagged by the school, but it will rarely be flagged by the school. Right. And what you were referring to before, you know, are those colleges that are going to require the CSS profile right. in addition to the FAFSA. So there's some colleges that do require a supplemental financial aid form in addition to the FAFSA in order to determine financial aid. And there aren't a lot of assets or anything protected on that form. Um, and that's what Robert was referring to, where, you know, they're going to see the other parents information on that form. And if it looks a little you know, like more income and then the FAFSA, so that's kind of what you were referring to. Yeah. So, okay. Um, so on that same note, I know even for me being in this field, there was a little bit of misinformation out there that I received at the beginning regarding um, parents or students who are separated and whether or not they will need to be legally separated going forward for FAFSA purposes. I actually was under the impression for a little bit that that was going to need to be the case, but recently found out that's not. So if you could elaborate on that. Yeah, so 
Um, historically, the department has allowed people to use the to define themselves as separated, even if, if they're still married, as long as they lived apart from each other as though they were unmarried. Um, it didn't have to be a legal separation. There didn't have to be a divorce in progress. Um, they just had to kind of say, um, I would say, the way I used to describe it to uh, people would ask me was, outside of dealing with the child you share, which you're going to have to interact with, if you live independent lives, then you would be separated if you live in separate homes. Okay. Um, and you, uh, just like you, I think the entire higher ed community was under the impression that starting in 24, 25, um, that kind of casual separation was going away and we were going to have to look at legal separations. But that is not the case. There has been, there's nothing in the Theft Simplification Act that defines separation any differently from its historical definition. And we did get a very subtle uh, answer from the department about that, that basically said there's no, the FAFSA does not mention legal separation. So that old definition carries forward um, unless the department provides future guidance. I think that old, that, that old definition that a casual separation, meaning not sharing a home and not, and living as though you're not married is, uh, people should feel comfortable saying they're separated Good. in that case. Yeah. And that's great to know. Like I said, I was even under the impression for a little while that was going to change. So I wanted to make sure we put that out there and, and clarified that. Now, who this is, there's going to be a really imp big impact for dependent students that would normally be considered dependent that are under 24 years old and, mm -hmm. and are married. Right now, the way it stands, when you, a student's under 24 years old and they're married, but they're separated, they're still considered independent for FAFSA purposes. That's yes. going to change for 24, 25, right? That is correct. Yes. Okay. So a student who is married but separated will be a dependent student um, instead of an independent student in 24, 25 and going forward. Okay. Yes. So that's a really, really big change. Um, something yes. important to talk about. Okay, now let's move into verification and, and talk a little bit about what that means. Uh, I usually get a lot of, you know, students and parents that have this natural reaction of, did I do something wrong? Am I in trouble? And, you know, what do I need to provide if I get selected for verification? So you can, can you just talk a little bit about this for us? Yes, absolutely. So um, the first thing I would say is verification is not punitive. It's not targeting people. Um, the, and historically, with years of data, the department was able to kind of identify people that it wanted to provide, to ask for additional information or have the schools ask for additional information um, that uh, were, that's in the department's model were, were more likely than other people, but certainly not very likely to have made a mistake in the application. Um, now, because we're going to a completely new formula and process, verification selection in 2425 will be completely random. Um, every single person listening in here has exactly the same likelihood of being selected for verification as everybody else, because there's no historical evidence to suggest that this particular person might have made a mistake more likely than the other one. So for at least 2425, if you get selected for verification, just take a deep breath. It's, it's um, not you. It's uh, the randomness in the department's computers. And so the good news on verification is um, we are moving to a model where the IRS um, will be populating most people's income information in the FAFSA. Um, historically, we've had the IRS data retrieval tool where the each person working on the FAFSA would be invited to let the IRS bring data into their application, but they could turn it down. Starting in 2425, it's the opposite. Um, people will have to authorize the Department of Education to get their information from the IRS. Um, if you don't authorize it, the app, the FAFSA won't be valid. The student won't be eligible for financial aid. But if you do authorize it, and the data is brought in through the IRS, 
it's complete, it's considered accurate. There's no verification. Even if you were selected for verification, you would have no extra steps to take. Um, and so for a lot of people, verification is going to be a marker on the student's uh, information uh, uh, FAFSA summary that they get. And the school's going to say, don't worry about it. All the data came in from the IRS. Um, and so it's, that should be much simpler. Right. Now, and the only thing, the only population this might impact are those parents or students who are separated, but they did yeah. file a joint tax return. So of course they yes. don't want to bring in their joint tax return. Yeah. So there, there's going to be like some checks around that or that's yes. going to be addressed, right? All right. So, so remember the sampling is random. So if someone, um, either the student or the student's parents, are if the, that FAFSA was selected for verification, a random process in 2425, if the data came in through the, uh, the what we call the Future Act Direct Data Exchange, the FADDX, that's the tool, um, then that data is considered valid. If it couldn't bring data in because the parent is divorced or separated, but they filed a married tax return, um, so there's a joint, ta a joint tax return at the IRS and the IRS can't split the data. So the person had been asked to manually enter the data. In that case, the person will be asked to send a copy of their tax return and fill out a family size statement um, that just says, here are the people in my family, here are how old they are, and here the here's how they're related to the student. Okay. And so um, not too, not too onerous, but there will be some people doing that. And there are four data elements that are on the tax return that the IRS couldn't provide the Department of Education. So if people had these, they will have to manually enter them. Um, they are, if they had an IRA rollover, a pension rollover, um, had earned income in a foreign country that was uh, taken out of their adjusted gross income through the foreign earned income exclusion, and if they had the earned income credit. Okay. And so if people had any of those four things, they're going to have to manually answer those questions in the application, even if the rest of the data came in through the IRS uh, FADDX tool. And those people will have to submit a, a piece of paper to the school to verify that data. And that kind of answers my next question because there's been an issue in the past with the IRS data retrieval tool and rollovers and not it not yeah. being calculated correctly. So it sounds like this yep. is kind of a fix to it. So if they yeah. have a rollover, they're going to have to report that separately so that. Right. Okay. Uh, the, the way the IRS data is structured, the IRS can't separate the rollover from actual untaxed pension distributions. So the IRS can only tell the institution or the FAFSA, the person had $50,000 of untaxed distributions from their IRAs, but we don't know about the rollover, get it from them. Right. That's not, that's the same in the IRS DRT world, the old world as it is in the new world. And so, if someone had a rollover and they don't want that to be treated as income and the student was selected for verification, then this, the school will ask the family to send a signed statement that says, I did in fact have a rollover this big in 2022 and that that will be the documentation of family. So they're going to be able to, to see that. Okay. Yes. yes. So on that same line, you know, let's talk a little bit about simplified needs formula. Yeah. Um, I, what I've read, because right now that threshold is about $50,000. You know, if a family earns under $50,000, that's kind of an automatic zero EFC. So yes. I've heard that's increasing to 60,000. And can you talk a little bit about what, you know, this formula is and are there any other factors that people should know about when it comes to simplified needs? There's actually two different simple uh, simplified formulas. Um, and they're, 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 both of them have changed. And so the, the first one, which in 2023, 24 and earlier was called the automatic zero EFC, um, basically said, um, if you earn less than $29,000 and you didn't 
file a schedule one i mean the, i don't need to get into too much of the details basically if you earned less than twenty nine thousand dollars and had a simple tax return we're just going to set your uh efc to zero and not ask you to fill out the rest of the application no assets nothing no right. assets no untaxed income no student information for a dependent uh student um that is gone but has been replaced by something called maximum pell and so Instead of if your AGI was less than $29,000 and you had a relatively simple application, you get an auto zero EFC. Today, the formula is if you're, depending on your marital status, family size, and the state you live in, if your AGI is smaller than for a married couple, two. 225% of the federal, po federal poverty guidelines for your state and family size, or for a household headed by one person, 175% of those, then you get what we call maximum Pell, which, will, which would be a Pell grant in the order of $7,500. So it's really only based on AGI and family size. And AGIs are much higher. So um, I was running some numbers and I had a like a $73,000 AGI for a family of five getting maximum Pell. Okay. And so that is, that is much higher than the $29,000. So, yeah. so on that, on that formula, um, on that basis, we should see a lot more people getting that benefit of that automatic zero. Okay. Uh, effectively. And, and the best thing, one of the, the best thing about maximum Pell is you get maximum Pell, which is a grant at the $7,500 range. The other good thing about it is the student aid index is no, never going to be greater than zero for people who are eligible for maximum Pell. Right, right. Yeah. And then, you know, right now as it stands, if it's a simple tax return, they make under yeah. a certain amount of money, it, yeah. there's a question that pops up and says, do you want to skip questions about your assets? Yes. So going forward, so it, from what I've read, it looks like if it's a simple tax return, that'll stand. But if they file schedules, or th then that's going to be a little different, right? So, uh, so yeah. So, so that's the second simple formula that we did call the simplified formula, and in earlier times we called it the simple needs test. And so, in the old world, the simple needs test was if your AGI was up to fifty thousand dollars and you had a simple tax return then you didn't have to report assets on the application. That has been replaced by the unnamed concept of applicant exempt from asset reporting. We, we, we don't have a nice title for it yet. And the difference is the AGI instead of 50,000 is 60,000. And you would be eligible not to report your assets as long as you didn't file schedule A, B, D, E, F, and H. Okay. And if you file the schedule C, it's okay as long as your loss or gain is no greater than $10,000. So again, it's a simplified application process, um, but um, the AGI is a little higher. So the first one is you just get a lot of money because you have a relative, your AGI is low relative to the positive poverty guidelines and you had it doesn't even uh, require a simple simple application it just is your AGI the second one is you have a higher you may maybe you have a higher uh, AGI but you don't have to provide assets because based on the simplicity of your tax return the assumption is there's not a lot of assets to report okay okay that's a lot of great information. These are all the questions that, you know, you see things swirling around. I'm, I have people yeah. messaging me every day. What does this mean? So I really appreciate your insight and expertise on kind of going over all this. So what I'd like to do now is just kind of go through a few questions. We have a bunch coming in and I feel like we've answered some of them talking about like the simplified needs and things like that. Um, but there are some questions. So I'm going to, we'll just spend a few minutes answering what we can and, um, let me just kind of go through those, Robert, and see. Okay. Um, so let's see. Somebody said, I received a large sum of money as an untaxed capital gain from the sale of my uncle's estate. How will that be handled? Cash in counts. Not quite sure what that means. 
Okay. But the capital. Okay. So if you do, you want to talk about okay. that? So I, in the past, that untaxed capital gain from the sale of property would have been reported as untaxed income, but because it doesn't appear in the tax return and it's not defined in the law, then that is no longer reportable as untaxed income. If the cash exists in an account at the time you file the application, then it is a reportable asset. Um, so uh, while you're not gonna have to deal with the capital gain being reported as untaxed income, you do have to report the, uh, any residual cash that resides in your account and, are, and is yours as an asset when the application is filed. Okay. But on that same note, you know, there's a process called special circumstances where colleges will take into consideration if you have like a one-time inflation of income due to a capital gain or retirement distribution or something like that, where you can report this information to the financial aid offices and let them know this. And then they could technically take it out of the equation for calculating financial aid, correct? I mean, that's, that yeah, doesn't seem yeah, to be but changing. In this case, the income... It's not going. It doesn't have to be reported at all. So at all, right? Pull out. Yes. Okay. Right. Um, and, and I'm also I'm I'm very hesitant to encourage people to talk about windfalls as um, as kind of a reason why the school should give them more financial aid. Um, because having been a financial aid officer, I would get people say. You know, I hit the lottery in 2022 and I earned and I won one point four million dollars, but that's not really income. So I don't think I, you should pretend I didn't get that money and give me more financial aid. And you can hear how that might sound to a financial aid officer. Right. Um, so so right. Um, the, the financial aid officers, they can remove one-time income. For example, um, an example might be uh, the company that I worked for was acquired and all of our stock options cashed out at the same time. And there's like $40,000 of profit there, but I don't have stock options anymore. So I'm not going to have any that income anymore. That That's not a windfall. That's like beyond their control. That's the kind of school thing that schools are going to want to adjust for. Right. But, you know, you know, people, I, I remember when I was working at MIT, people would call me up and say, um, I, I, my great aunt just died and I just earned $400,000. And I'm really concerned that that's going to impact the amount of financial aid I'm going to get next year. And I, and, and I understand the sentiment, but you weren't expecting that money and you're coming to me asking me to continue to commit limited resources to you. So just be mindful of the, the you know, the perspective of the college and things like that and about how, um, how that kind of windfall might not be the best thing to kind of worry about right uh, <laughs> that makes sense yeah there's no hardship there the, yeah. the department of education seems to be moving toward the special circumstances needs to be backed by a hardship right and you know so uh, i i think we might see schools get more and more reluctant to do non-hardship related income changes okay great that's great information so we do have a question about the assets, because when we got into that question, I think we kind of skipped over that a little bit yeah. and we started talking about untaxed income. So if we just yeah. want to clarify, because there are some changes happening with what assets yeah. need to be reported. Yeah. So, so the, big, the big structures haven't changed too much. Um, you'll still be reporting you know, your bank accounts. You'll still be reporting your taxable investment accounts, um, uh, real estate that you own other than the home that you live in. Um, those those big things haven't changed. Um, the, a couple of changes that have happened are um, related to businesses and farms. Um, in 2023, 24 and earlier, when it came to businesses, small family owned businesses didn't have to be reported as assets on the application. So if right. um, the business was owned and controlled by more than 50% of the family members, or if more than 50% of the business was controlled by family members and it had fewer than 100 employees, the value wasn't reportable on the application. That exemption is gone. So 
even small family owned business has businesses have to be reported on the application. And then for farms, uh, working family farms were exempt. So if a family lived and worked on their farm, then the value of the farm didn't have to be reported. That exemption has also been pulled back. Right. Um, so now if someone is living on a working farm, then they have to report the value of the farm outside of the portion of the farm that is their residence. And there's rules about what that is. Basically, it says the home and any attached uh, buildings that are not being used for the farm can be excluded from the value of the farm. Um, but those are big changes um, that for people who have small businesses and especially for people who live on a farm. Yeah, those and, are really big. Yeah. And, you know, it's not going to happen in 24, 25, but there is a fair amount of political pressure to reverse that reversal. And so right. it wouldn't surprise me if in 25, 26, we went back to the exclusions being back in place. I mean, there's, I work with so many families where they own small businesses and I have a couple yeah. of questions in here. What if I own a business less than 20 K? So the yeah. reality is that's going to be reported as an asset on the 24, 25 FAFSA. If they yeah, own that a small correct. business. Yeah. Yes. But, okay. but let, let's, let's, let's point out the good news here. Um, the department is very clear that they're looking for some of the parts value of a business. Um, and that means if you read the instructions in the application, it says, um, uh, it describes how the business, like if you have a computer, what's it worth? If you have a desk, what's it worth? If you have a, you know, X, Y, or Z, what's it worth? And then subtract any debt you've accumulated. There. Right, right. It's, now that's different from the profile. The profile asks for the value of the business if you were to sell it today. Right. And, and so most people like an accountant, I think about an accountant or, you know, I, I don't want to put you on a spot. I'm not asking you to put a valuation on your business, but oh, you know, totally. in terms of the property that you own, right. You're, you're not going to have a big number to put down. Exactly. For a lot of small business owners, right. right? You know, Same, yes. Yeah. An accountant has a computer yeah. and some tax software, uh, right. you know, uh, you know, even a landscaper might have a big truck and a bunch of tools, but right. there's going to be some car debt on that and stuff. So, Small businesses are small for a reason, and then the numbers will probably continue to be small. Thanks for, for clarifying yeah. that. That's helpful. So it's yeah. probably not going to have a really huge impact on, on a lot of small business owners when for that reason. Yeah. There right. is somebody asking about what about unmarried parents? And I, I know it's when yes. parents are unmarried but living in the same household as it stands right now, then they both yes. need to fill out the FAFSA. That's going to stay the same going forward? That's correct. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. So if you were living in different households um, and separated, that would be different. But if you're unmarried, living in the same household, then both parents need to fill out the FAFSA. Um, we have time for a couple more questions here. Let, let's um, go, let's, don't, we have to forget the other asset change. Though, oh, right, right. Which okay. is, um, if you are, if you've saved for your son or daughter's education in a 529 plan or a covered education savings account, um, the rules have changed, um, you used to have to report 529s that you owned no matter who the beneficiary was. But um, in 24-25, you only report 529s that you own that the student is the beneficiary of. Yes, and, this is a big one. And this is a this is a significant change as well that we kind of wanted. I just want to make sure we had a chance to uh, Thank remind you. people about. Thank yeah. you for pointing that out, because I think a lot of times, too, families have kind of made the assumption when they're filling out the FAFSA that they're only supposed to count the 529 for the child. Yeah. Yes. But that's not the case as it, as it has been all along. But going forward, that will be the case. And that's that's pretty significant. So thank you for, yes. for sharing that. Um, another question. Um, what if my current income is wildly different than the tax return year upon which my FAFSA will be based on? I'm currently only receiving unemployment insurance income, which is about one eighth of what my income was the prior year. Okay. So that's that's a great question. And that's what we were kind of hinting about earlier about um, special circumstances, special circumstances and asking uh, for um, what, what the school call what but schools refer to vernacularly as an appeal, but kind of the term that they use is professional judgment. So, I mean, if we step back a second, 
you know, a lot of people, if you think about it, why are they asking about my 2022 income when I'm going to be paying for college when my kid enters school in August of 2024? Right. You know, and there's months separated there. And the underlying assumption is that for most people, incomes are relatively consistent and grow in predictable ways. So if we know what you earned in 2022, we have a reasonable sense of what we are going to be earning in 2024 and 2025. And so we can get a reasonable assessment of how much resources you'll have available for college. The whole special circumstances process is for people for whom that assumption breaks down. So if you are reporting a lot more income on the application because it's 2022, then you'll have during the academic year, the schools are prepared to address that. They'll ask you to document your, uh, estimate what your income will be. They may ask you what what happened in 2023, they, if the change happened after 2023, they may try to construct an estimated year worth of income, but they will work with you to try to get an idea of how much income you'll either have concurrently with the academic year, or if the change happened but was stable by 2023, maybe they'll just say, okay, we'll look at 2023 instead, and they can recalculate eligibility for financial aid based on um, a good assessment of what a more realistic year of income would be. And it's important to note, this is where a lot of confusion happens because you fill out the FAFSA. So people think, okay, I got to contact the government and FAFSA. So you fill out the FAFSA, send it to the government for processing. The government sends all those results over to the college financial aid offices. So any changes like this that Robert's referring to, lower income, you're actually going to report those directly to the college financial aid offices and not the government or the FAFSA directly. There's really no way to do that. Um, there's a lot of confusion around that. So thank you for, for clarifying. Um, another question, wife, my wife is a sole trustee and sole beneficiary of her father's irrevocable trust. Are the yeah. trust assets, which consists of money market accounts and real estate reportable? Yes. That's a tough yeah. question. Um, yeah. yes. Um, so you said irrevocable trust. Irre irrevocable, yes. Uh, no, I'm not, I'm, yeah. So because if it were a if it were a uh, living trust or a revocable trust, right? Then it's it's the it's owned by the people who set up the trust. But an right. irre an irrevocable trust, um, this is really complicated. But technically, the value of that trust does have to be reported on the application but not the value of the beneficiaries kind of claim on the trust, but this is going to be a lot of words that unless you're really big into finance is going to go over your head. Mm. But the value of the trust is the net present value of the future distributions of the trust to the beneficiary. And which is a long way of saying that if there's a hundred thousand dollars in the trust, but the beneficiary can't have it for 25 years, then the value is the amount that they would have to put in a savings account today to have $100,000 in 25 years, because that's the present value of the trust. Right. So what does that mean to the person who asked the question? The answer is, um, if you were to ask the school, the school would say, ask the trustee for the net present value of the future distributions of the trust. And the trustee is going to be Uncle Joe, and Uncle Joe's not going to know what that means. So what I would say is make your best estimate of what the value to the trust over time is, and then you know, discount it down based on how long that is. If if the trust is going to pay out um a hundred thousand dollars in 25 years. Maybe it's worth $5,000 today or something like that. Right. Best thing about assets on the application is they're not, they're not verifiable. Right. Um, self-reporting. Self-reporting. If you yeah. make a good faith effort, it's unlikely the school is going to ask you uh, for more information than that. And if they do, and you made a good faith effort and you, have a, you can explain it, that's fine. There's no problem. Right. right. One hint though, having spent six months doing as a consultant doing institutional need analysis for a school 
make sure your answers on the FAFSA and the profile to the same question are the same. Yeah. Because if they're not, yeah. then the school's not going to believe anything in that. It's going to get sticky. Red flag, yeah. right? Very so big this, red flag. Yeah. So this leads yeah. into a question somebody's asking, will any of the changes to the FAFSA carry over to the CSS profile in your opinion? Um, so my understanding is the CSS profile is aligning the parent definition so that mm -hmm. this, the same parent will be sitting in the same place and the uh, the FAFSA parent will be the in the same place in the profile for each applicant. Um, and they're, they are eliminating just one kind of uh, untaxed income, uh, which is flexible spending accounts. They're not asking about flexible spending accounts this year. But otherwise, the profile is just going to be like it was last year. Yeah, and they pretty much ask everything. Yeah. yeah. Still, okay. they'll still do a two in college treatment. So if the school is going to award financial aid based uh, its own financial aid based on the profile, the two in college issue is not a factor that you have to worry about. Um, uh, so yeah, the, the profile is going to be pretty consistent with the FAFSA. Now, let me, one, one, one caveat to that is um, there is a version of the FAFSA, of the version of the profile called the Profile Light, L-I-G-H-T, which is really designed to replicate the old FAFSA so that schools that wanted the W-2 401k contributions and wanted the housing and all of that could still get that. Um, so it is possible um, if, if the student is applying to schools that require the FAFSA, but all of them only want the light FAFSA, it is possible that the profile will be much simpler than it has been in the past for that small sub, subgroup of people. Which is nice because the, the profile is a pretty tedious form. Profiles are bare. Yes. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> and then you have to do it twice if there's yeah. uh, divorce or separation. So, yeah, right, it's right. It's different than the FAFSA when you're divorced or separated, only one parent needs to fill it out. But on the CSS profile, yeah, custodial and non-custodial parents yes. fill it out. So I'm going to just a couple more questions and then we're going to finish up. I, I know I have, lot, I have a lot more questions coming in, um, but, you know, I will address these like in my private Facebook group and I'll do some videos on my YouTube channel. It's just hard to kind of answer all these questions. But I'm trying to, to um, capture the most common themes here. So this one is related to household size. How is household size determined? Is it based on the dependents claimed on your taxes? For example, if there are two kids with divorced parents, each parent claims on taxes one child, but would the parent filling out the FAFSA have a household size of only two or three? This is where a lot of confusion happens. Yeah. It doesn't really matter, yeah. right? I mean, it's a, it... it's a great question Yeah, um, because it's a little bit more complex than it used to be. So right. um, again, because the FAFSA Simplification Act is trying to align the FAFSA with the tax return, when someone... Uh, authorizes the IRS to give FAFSA information, the IRS is going to include the number of people that would have been exemptions if we still had exemptions and the number of dependents. And that will be sitting in a field in the application which will be used as family size. Now, we're looking at 2022 families on the, FAFSA, on the tax return and the FAFSA will be filed out after that. You know, people can have had new children, people can have passed away, people can have gotten divorced. So everyone will be asked, if your family size is different from the number of people on your application, on your tax return, put tell us and, and then you put in another number. And so in an example I use in my training, the FAFSA, the tax return has five dependent, uh, five people on it, um, but they adopted a child in 2023. And so the IRS is going to say there's five people on this tax return. The individual is going to say, yeah, but I have six people now and six will be the family size. Okay. Um, so it doesn't so, matter, right? If their parents are splitting up, it's, it goes by yes. the number in the actual household. No, nope, it goes, you identify the parent that's providing the most support. Right. And then, and then in that parent's household, it's, 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 yeah, pretty much. It's yeah. that parent, the student, 
and then the student siblings who live in that household or okay. are away at college. Okay. And then anybody else like grandma or someone that's living in that household is supported by the parent. Okay. Yes. That's yes. good. That's a confusing one. You know, yeah. a, a lot of families yeah. get hung up on parents that claim the children and things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, there's, one, go ahead. One, one thing on that is the tool is only going to ask, is the number of people in your household different from the number of people on the tax return? But it's not actually going to tell you what that number is. And so my advice would be, if there's been a change in your family, answer that question anyway, even if you don't know the number on, on the tax return. Um, and if you discover later on that you, it was the wrong number, then go ahead and tell the school because they can correct that. Awesome. Thank you. That's great information. People, unfortunately, people aren't going to get to see the data that the IRS put in the application. So you won't know if that number is correct. Right. Right. Exactly. And I do, there are some questions coming in where um, we did address the questions earlier in the webinar. So just for everybody that's still on and watching this, I am going to send the recording out to all of you just so we're not going to spend time kind of re-answering things that we've already talked about. So you'll all get this recording um, first thing in the morning when it's available. Um, but with that said, I just want to thank you for joining us so much, Robert, um, for all your expertise and really taking a deep dive into these changes. I know there's so many questions, um, so I really, really appreciate it. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, I hope uh, your uh, audience has found this interesting. Yeah, getting yeah. a lot of thank yous and, and thanks for your help. And just a reminder, you know, for anybody that's never worked with me before, I offer a free initial 10 minute consultation call that you can book right through my website, thefafsaguru.com. Happy to answer any questions maybe you have tonight that we couldn't get to because there's a lot of you. And then um, parents of high school seniors, my financial aid academy enrollment is still open for that if anybody's looking for assistance through the process. So um, lots of thank yous, um, great information, great webinar. So glad that you all found it helpful. And thanks again, Robert. I really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Good night, everybody. Hey, okay, take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.